If you like this channel and what I do here, please help to support my work by checking out one of my books, available from Lulu Publishing and Amazon.com. Thank you. Hi folks, Carl James here from Electric Media Madness and welcome to the first episode of In The Weeds, the series that does what it says on the label and delves into the proverbial weeds of the science fiction and science fantasy genre by examining noted TV shows, Hollywood films, genre writers, producers and directors and their connections to aspects of what I call the hidden global or elite agendas. Some of these stories might be conspiratorial in nature, some will connect with the clandestine agendas and workings of the film and television industry, others will be a little more esoteric or out there on the fringe of human consciousness and reality. Today I'm going to be discussing a genuinely subversive and thought-provoking television show that first aired in September 1967. Although the show only lasted for a single season of 17 episodes, this series truly left its mark on the cultural landscape. The Prisoner, metaphorically prodded and poked at the dark corners of social engineering paradigms, elite control and power structures, the illusion of reality, the phenomenon of trauma-based mind control, the list goes on and on. Moreover, the messages, themes and implications of the show can be felt today more profoundly than ever before. Conceived by Danger Man script editor George Markstein and Patrick McGowan, the inspiration for the television show came from stories of World War II prisoners of war who were incarcerated in relatively benign surroundings. Their conversations were recorded and habits were strictly monitored by the authorities. Such an idea had previously been explored in the Danger Man episode Colony 3, which featured an Eastern European simulation town. In numerous interviews, Mark Stein took credit for this concept in The Prisoner, claiming it had been inspired by a Scottish location called Invalair Lodge, a place where spies who knew too much were sent. Tellingly, knowledge of Invalair Lodge was not publicly known until well into the production of The Prisoner. Mark Stein always maintained that he was an ex-spy and worked for the MI5, an assertion that had been maintained in most books written about both Mark Stein and The Prisoner. However, one or two researchers, such as the author of the blog Number 6 Was Innocent, McGowan and The Prisoner, have compiled some compelling information suggesting that Markstein may have had no such affiliations and gleaned his inside knowledge from others. Regarding the inspirational idea for The Prisoner, it seems likely that it actually came from the extraordinarily creative mind of Patrick McGowan rather than Markstein. Although many have argued, including McGowan, that The Prisoner is not really science fiction, I believe that the show can readily be categorised as such. Prisoner was a curious mix of then-cultural zeitgeist, Orwellian themes, social indoctrination, drug-induced states of consciousness, mind control, the notion of the individual versus the collective. Much of the content of the show seemed to eerily mirror the covert affairs of the US military and the CIA during the 1950s and 1960s, posing the question of how much McGowan and his writers really knew about certain aspects of the world. The tone of The Prisoner, notably different from other spy thrillers, makes one wonder whether or not the show was a subtle form of disclosure. The show had many iconic themes and forms of imagery, including the network of surveillance cameras that dotted the show's locale, known as The Village. There was also the eerie, all-seeing eye of Number 2's command centre, the significance of the numbers themselves used to name the residents of The Village, and so on. The numbers may have represented several levels of meaning. I find it telling that the first episode, Arrival, repeatedly highlighted the number 6 and multiples of 6, perhaps indicating the 666 paradigm. Very shortly after arriving, Number 6 is appointed the maid to gain his confidence, who's called Number 66. When he takes his first walk in the village and meets his inhabitants, he converses with a naval admiral playing a game of chess. The admiral has a badge on his cap adorned with the Number 66. His first hope of escape appears in the form of a helicopter with the serial number 1203, 1 plus 2 plus 0 plus 3 equals 6. The only character in the episode that appears to react to the village in a similar manner to Number 6 is named Cobb. His designated number, 9, is an inverted 6. In the episode Free For All, Number 6 tries to ignite a democratic revolution in the village. As he incites the crowd, his onlookers are heard chanting, note the emphasis on the position of the pause, 666, 666. Commenting on the use of the numbers in the show, McGowan once said, quoted in Jay Dyer's 2015 article Numbered Man and Analysis of the Prisoner, numerology were all becoming ciphers. The tipping of the hat, or the be seeing you gesture, used as a form of salutation amongst villagers, is similar to several notions used in Freemasonry as well as ones used early in Christianity. McGowan once argued that it was the single most important piece of symbolism in the show, although curiously we refrain from explaining why. Years later, J. Michael Straczynski would use the same motif in his science fiction epic series Babylon 5. In this case, it was used to indicate those people involved with the Psychor organisation, a powerful and shadowy group of humans with psychic and mind control abilities. The phrase, I am not a number, I am a free man, became identifiable with notion of being watched by the state and passed into the cultural lexicon in much the same way as Orwell's Big Brother did. 
The show reflected growing concerns regarding globalisation and the advent of surveillance technology. This was particularly prescient given that these subjects are probably even more important today than they ever were at the time. In so many ways, The Prisoner remains a relevant socio-political commentary. The Prisoner had many significant episodes. The episode Free for All involved number six running for political office, highlighting the stage management and hypocrisy of democratic election process. In The Schizoid Man, number six is subjected to mind-controlling aversion therapy. The General dealt with mind-altering education technology known as speed learn and subliminal indoctrination. Checkmate dealt with yet more mind-control themes containing techniques that mirrored the Milgram experiment, Ash Conformity experiments and the Stanford Research Institute prison experiments. The final episode, Fallout, metaphorically demonstrated how the ruling elite simultaneously controlled, amongst other things, the 60s political decision makers and the opposing countercultural movement as well, by allowing the rebellious beatnik and the Westminster politician to escape the village with number six in the closing moments of the show. Regarding the larger global agenda, the prisoner gave away its biggest clue very early on in the second episode, The Chimes of Big Ben. Number two talks to number six about his dream of a global village, a term readily used by proponents of global governance today. It exposes the illusion of nations and borders and sides with competing agendas and specifically talks about a world order. Number two says it doesn't matter which side runs the village. Number six says it's run by one side or the other. Number two replies, oh, certainly, but both sides are becoming identical. What, in fact, has been created is an international community, a perfect blueprint for world order. When the sides facing each other suddenly realise they are looking into a mirror, they will see that this is the pattern for the future. The journalist Steve Rose once wrote in his 2009 Guardian newspaper article, Be Seeing You Remembering Patrick McGowan. Without The Prisoner, we'd never have had cryptic mind-bending TV series like Twin Peaks or Lost. It's the Citizen Kane of British television, a programme that changed the landscape and quite possibly destroyed its creator. This reference to The Prisoner possibly destroying Patrick McGowan is often cited by media historians, and it's a very misleading perspective of the man behind the show. McGowan had a very realistic view of television and film, specifically in Hollywood, and he combined this view with a deeply personal moral centre. He generally disliked forms of violence in television and film, particularly in things in which he starred, although that pattern didn't always hold. But he specifically referred not to kiss or engage in social activities with his female co-stars, partly because he believed there was far too much sexuality displayed in television and film already, partly because of his religious beliefs, he had a Catholic background, and partly because of his love and dedication to his wife and his family. He mostly removed himself from television genre following The Prisoner because of his concerns about the way the medium was changing. He turned down some important roles, what would have perhaps been career-defining roles, such as playing James Bond, for similar reasons. He starred in two films for Disney, but later expressed some quite candid remarks about The House of Mouse. He also chose his remaining film roles very carefully and sparingly, often playing roles with a thematic similarity to that of Number 6. Media historians have debated how much of The Prisoner was influenced by McGowan, Whilst many people were involved with the production of the show, it's true that McGowan did become somewhat consumed with the production. He wrote several episodes, either under his own name or a pseudonym, and substantially rewrote many scripts by other writers. He also directed several episodes, again under his own name or a pseudonym, and produced and edited the show as well. Creatively, the show was very much McGowan's baby. In the Channel 4 documentary, uh, Six Into One, The Prisoner File, he said, What was the germ of the idea, how long it had been in my head, it was in my head from the very early days, since maybe about six or seven years old. The individual against the establishment, the individual against bureaucracy, the individual against so many laws that were all confining, the church for instance. It was almost impossible to do anything without some form of sin. McGowan fully understood the significance of the themes and messages portrayed in The Prisoner, even if the viewer didn't always fully grasp what he was getting at. In the few interviews he gave in his life, McGowan continually espoused the show's significance and even gave some curious insights into his own worldview. As early as 1968, he said, quoted in the 2012 article, Solitary Purda, the sovereign man is the real prisoner. At this moment, individuals are being drained of their personality and being brainwashed into slaves. The inquisition of the mind by psychiatrists is far worse than the assault on the body of torturers. In 1977, he was interviewed by Warner Troyer in front of a Toronto audience for the Canadian Public Television Network TV Ontario. The interview contained a wealth of clues to McGowan's life, work and worldview. He talked about his belief that rapid technology development was and is in actuality part of a mechanism used to enslave humanity. He said, I think we're progressing too fast. I think we should pull back and consolidate the things that we've discovered. McGowan identified that the show's famous penny-farthing bicycle logo, a symbol of man's illusory faith in technology progression. He was also highly critical of advertising and the commercial corporate world. In an audio interview for Roger Goodman included on the disc six of the Prisoner Blu-ray box set, McGowan alluded to the use of sex and subliminals in advertising. In the aforementioned Canadian 1977 interview, he was far more scathing. He begins by talking about the soulless nature of the village's inhabitants. 
This is what he said. Ah, the majority of them have been sort of brainwashed. Their souls have been brainwashed out of them. Watching too many commercials is what happened to them. Troyer then says to him, I used to think the television commercials were spiritually healthy because they made us sceptical and that was probably a very good thing to learn very early on. McGowan replied, well, they don't make enough people sceptical because if they made enough people sceptical, the people who were made sceptical wouldn't be buying all the junk they're advertising and they'd be out of business. We're run by the Pentagon. We're run by Madison Avenue. We're run by television. And as long as we accept those things and don't revolt, we'll all have to go along with the stream of the eventual avalanche. As long as we go out and buy stuff, we're at their mercy. We're at the mercy of the advertiser, and of course there are certain things that we need, but a lot of the stuff that is brought is not needed. We live in a little village. Your village may be different from other people's villages, but we're all prisoners. McGowan also expanded on the cryptic ending of the prisoner, explaining that it's not the mass of humanity in prison, but that it is also, to some degree, its own jailer and his jail cell. He said, The greatest enemy that we have, number one, was depicted as an evil governing force in his own village. So who is number one? We just see the number twos, the sidekicks. Now this overriding evil force is as it's most powerful within ourselves, and we have to constantly fight it, I think. That is why I made number one an image of number six, his other half, his outer ego. He hasn't got any freedom, which is the whole point. When that door opens on its own, in the final scene, exactly the same as all the doors in the village open. You know that somebody is in there waiting, there to start it all over again. He's got no freedom. Freedom is a myth. The biggest clue to this notion was conveyed in the opening of every episode of The Prisoner. Number six asked number two why he had been brought to the village and what they wanted from him. Each always replied, information. The emphasis on the phonetic pronunciation of the word in the episode is always in, pause, formation. And I would suggest that number six's wardens don't actually want information in the traditional sense of the word. What they want rather is for him to be or stay in formation, as in fitting into a formational order. They want him to conform to the system and they're not really interested in what number six knows. It's just that they want him to be obedient and controlled. This, I believe, is the most important message that we can glean from the prisoner. The Prisoner is a very profound show. It's something that I would recommend highly to rewatch, especially in this day and age, and moreover with what's happening in the world at the moment. Really worth taking the time to watch. I hope you've enjoyed this short video, maybe it'll give you a little bit more insight into what The Prisoner is. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button. If you like the content of this channel, please consider subscribing. And I will see you again soon.